any of you. I prepared a few slides just to briefly present myself. Also, we already heard uh, a few items, so I will pass on those ones uh, more quickly. And also for those who don't, who already know me, sorry, uh, just a short explanation. I mean, the reason I have a moustache at the moment is because I play in a 19th century musical. So I just hope this doesn't disturb you too much. So let's try to, okay. So as was mentioned, okay, those are uh, several places where um, I have been doing research. And after studying at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology or Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. And uh, now I work in a group of uh, Nicolas Brunner in Geneva. So during my career, I worked with uh, several students, bachelor in master, PhD students, as well as young postdocs. And uh, so here are the, the people that I currently work with. But my interactions are not limited to this group. And um, I like to work with people. And during my career, I managed to establish various fruitful collaboration with people in very different um, topics. I am still very enthusiastic about teamwork, actually. And I hope to be able to continue to create new collaborations. But maybe you're wondering, OK, what do I do with uh, these people? So just to give you a brief overview before going more into details, uh, I work in the field of quantum information. Um, and some of the main questions in this field include um, the understanding of quantum correlations, their role in various physical processes, and their potential at solving complex problems. So more in detail, I am interested in uh, uh, fundamental questions such as finding new insight into quantum theory itself, quantum information theory by itself also, quantum correlations I mentioned. And in all of this, I always, I'm also always uh, interested in finding applications, way to bring these um, topics to experiments or even further to applications. So this is a, a real read I have. And um, maybe I should mention that one of my key strengths in this context is uh, my ability to, to perform advanced numerical uh, uh, optimization to explore these kind of questions. So this talk will be organized around um, uh, quantum correlations. And so just to give you, uh, um, to say in a few words, I mean, quantum correlations, they stem from the property of entanglement, and meaning the fact that two systems, two subsystems, can behave essentially as one system, even when they are uh, far apart from each other. So I will start my presentation by giving a, a short pedagogic introduction to quantum correlations. Then I'll go more into detail and um, talk about some of my contributions in this area. Um, maybe I'll show how quantum correlation can be used to um, certify genuine randomness or to uh, certify devices in a black box manner. And finally, I'll discuss how uh, these ideas can be used to certify future quantum devices, uh, such as the quantum computer. So to start talking about quantum correlations, well, it's useful to start already with the general notion of classical correlations. And uh, I know, I, I trust that you are familiar with that as physicists. And so, of course, correlations are present everywhere, right? I mean, when uh, cherry tree blossoms, then it's spring and so on. So in general, this a correlation is something which involves uh, two uh, events or two objects. And so here, let's just consider a situation in which we have two parties, say A and B, or we call, can call them also Alice and Bob. And say Alice is uh, performing um, some experiment. And here, maybe she's um, throwing a coin. And she's just marking what are the results of this experiment. So it could be for instance, head, head, tail, head, and tail. And that's what she observes. Now, on his side, Bob is maybe doing a similar experiment where he also has a coin. And he observes, say, this sequence, which happens to be identical. So of course, in this case, the outcomes are fully correlated. And when this happens, it's uh, very natural to ask, well, how come that those two uh, 
set of outcomes were strictly identical. That is, we want to find a reason for the origin of correlations. And in general, there are two uh, possible explanations for correlations. One is simply uh, that, well, one event actually caused the other one. And um, so direct causal influence. I mean, this, for instance, if you wonder one day, why do you wake up always at the same time as the alarm clock is set? That's, of course, not surprising at all, because the alarm clock is waking you up. And another set of possible explanation without any direct link, causal link between uh, the two events is if a third uh, event is actually causing uh, both of the observed one. So this happens, for instance, um, if you see uh, a lightning and later you hear the thunder. I mean, it's not really that the lightning caused the thunder or the thunder caused the lightning, but it's more that the electric discharge caused both of them. And um, so it's also something which is very uh, common. But actually, it's also a mechanism that is used even in science. And just to give you uh, an example, just, I mean, in the case of the LIGO experiment, which was performed a few years ago, and is still running, they, they had two um, detectors, one situated in uh, Washington state in the United States, and the other in uh, Louisiana. And so those two were really far apart. And they observed signals at each position, which were uh, very highly correlated, a bit like the two uh, strings of coins that we had before. Now, because those two places are really far away and the signals are really uh, synchronized, it's reasonable to exclude the possibility that this correlation would be caused by a direct influence from one place to the other one. And therefore, this is uh, understood as, a, as, a, as a, a proof of the existence of a common cause that would create both of these observations. And so that was the first direct observation of gravitational waves, of course. So just like we can exclude direct causal influences as one possible explanation for correlations, we can also ask the question, is it possible to exclude common causes as an explanation for correlations that we observe? And so let's look a bit more into this. And so we come back to our two um, observers, A and B. And they will output, say, a bit, plus or minus one. And now we give a common cause to both of them. So this lambda here. Now, of course, we see that if this lambda just encodes the output that each of the party needs to produce, it's very easy to uh, produce fully correlated result or fully anti-correlated result. Therefore, it's also possible to produce any kind of correlation between Alice and Bob with this mechanism. However, if we provide inputs or measurement settings to each of these observer, then the game changes totally. And the reason for that is that now we start to have actually four contexts, which corresponds to each of the possible set of inputs, each of the possible value of x and y. And we can ask things which are impossible to do for uh, common causes. For instance, we can ask for results to be correlated when settings are 0 and 0 for both parties, and correlated in diagonal as well, and anti-correlated in the last case. And of course, if you try to do that with assignments, then you will fail because this last assignment here is um, in contradiction with this last requirement. And so this means that with settings, it's possible to have contradiction or to ex and exclude the possibility of common causes. And this can be is captured by um, Bell inequalities. And so in the, this particular paradox is captured by the so-called CHSH. Uh, quantity. Now, more generally, in this setting with uh, two uh, parties, of course, there can be many kind of uh, statistics, and we can ask, okay, where, when is it that some statistics can be explained or not, even though they might be compatible with uh, this particular uh, requirement that we that we that we ask there. And so, in general, to we can look at this problem, and the way to do it is to consider behaviors or conditional probability distributions. 
And these property distributions, they live in a space of dimension 16 in R16. And so we can look at it geometrically and ask what is the set of correlations that is achievable with common causes. And as it turns out, this set is a complex set and it can be characterized by a finite number of um, hyperplanes or boundaries, and those are called Bell inequalities. Now, the very interesting thing about this is that actually quantum theory can go beyond these constraints. And this is well known. And uh, the way to, do, to see this is to consider now correlations which come from measurements on some quantum state. And if the quantum state happens to be, for instance, a maximally entangled state of two qubits, then we can evaluate this S quantity we defined before. And we find a value 2 square 2, which is larger than the local bound, which is 2. So we find a point up there. So this means, OK, quantum theory is a normal call in this sense. Now, at this stage, it's useful to just uh, step back a moment and ask the question, OK, how, what are the kind of assumptions we need to reach the conclusion that we observe now, to reach the, to be able to exclude a uh, common causes? And um, if we go back in detail to, to the derivation um, of uh, what I just sketched briefly here, we can identify two uh, very important assumptions. And basically, those are that we need, we need two parties to be separated, A and B. And we also need somehow that the settings that are used on each, uh, on each side be really independent of any common cause that we are trying to exclude. So actually, this is a very small set of assumptions. And so what is somehow even more instructive to look at here is to ask, OK, what are the assumptions we don't need to make? And um, um, Basically, we realized that in no, no part of the discussion so far did we have to describe whether the, what was happening in A, in the box A, was maybe some uh, photon system or uh, some spin qubits or something else. Um, the conclusion still holds whatever degrees of freedom are actually there. It also holds independently of the dimension of the, of the, of the Hilbert space, which is needed to describe the system. And, um, it really depends not on any amount of um, trust we need to have on, say, even the calibration of, on the, of the measurements which are being performed inside those boxes. So this means that, I mean, in practice, if we want to do something like uh, this box A, we would have, of course, to, to use a, a physical system. But for every the whole discussion here, we can it's sufficient to just consider this system as being something inside the box. And what we will care about is what happens when we press on some button and we observe uh, some outcomes. Hence, we can really look at this box as a black box. And this is also referred to as the uh, device independent approach. OK, so now, is this approach useful for anything? I mean, it's very general. It uses very little assumptions. And so this brings us to the second part of my talk where um, we'll see what uh, can be said about randomness and black box certification in precisely um, uh, this device independent setting. So let's start with randomness. Um, I mean, what is randomness? Randomness is essentially unpredictability. So if I ask you the question, is uh, this particular bit string random? Well, you might think about it, but the answer is that, well, the question is ill-defined because I did not mention, is it random with respect to whom? I mean, for you, of course, who is watching this slide, it's not random because you know exactly every value of the bits. There's no uncertainty about that. But if you ask someone uh, outside who doesn't know about this slide, he might be, it might be difficult for him to predict really those values. So randomness really depends on the observer. And this means that it's not really a property, at least in terms of unpredictability. It's not a property of the uh, string itself. What matters more is where the string comes from. And so if we want to certify randomness, we will 
really need to rely on random processes. And um, so formally now, if we look at uh, this question in this black box um, scenario that we introduced before, we see that, okay, so we will have say maybe no, our two parties here, A and B, and uh, we'll have, we need to define who is trying to guess the outcomes. And this would be a third party, which is outside of this system. And so the game will be for this third party to um, get maybe some result on her side. That would be um, correlated with some of the outcomes here. But for sure to make things as, as general as possible, we would like to give any possible amount of information available to this, uh, to this adversary. So this means that virtually any information about what is going on inside these devices or in, about the states which are being measured or etc., all of this is accessible, is assumed to be accessible to or known to the adversary. And so this means that we would even give in principle more knowledge to the adversary than maybe even Alice and Bob have because in practice, everyone, uh, they will always have some amount of uncertainty uh, about their system, which can in principle be uh, improved. So now this is the setting and you see that actually this can be related now to this question of common causes because if for some reason the outcomes which are being produced in this experiment cannot be explained in terms of a common cause, then since by definition, everything that Eve can have access is only some common causes, then this means the outcome will also be unpredictable for the adversary. So this is the, 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 the basic idea of uh, uh, randomness in this device independent setting. And then the, the question that comes is naturally, okay, how can we formalize this question and make it really um, concrete? So to do this, we have to define really what is uh, randomness. And so randomness would be really um, the mean entropy or it's relate, which is related to the guessing probability, this probability that the adversary would guess uh, the outcomes which are observed. And the game is to try to quantify this quantity in terms, in presence of some um, side information lambda. And so when um, such information is available, well, the, what we can do is still describe the probability distributions observed by Alice and Bob in terms of this additional information. And therefore this allows us to define the average guessing probability of the adversary. Um, now this is a quantity that can be written here, but it's not necessarily easy to compute. For instance, you see this lambda is by definition all the information which is potentially accessible about the system. So we don't even have an upper bound on that. We don't know how much uh, information would be needed to really fully describe a, a setup. But nevertheless, it's possible to uh, use some tricks to compute this quantity. And so for instance, we can compute it with respect to this uh, CHSH parameter that we had before. And what we see is that indeed, when this value is uh, uh, larger than two, then it's possible to really guarantee that the outcomes which are produced by uh, the, the setup contain some amount of information which is absolutely inaccessible to any external party. Now, this is the theory, but I also had the chance to uh, not only work on that, but collaborate with an experimentalist to put this into practice. And so in particular, we worked uh, with uh, the group of Christian Kurzifer in Singapore, and um, they produced a, a very high speed uh, random number generator based on this principle exactly, uh, with an SPDC source. And so in this case, what we could uh, achieve is a key ra uh, a rate of random bits of a few hundred bits per second. And those are really uh, certified uh, in this device independent setting. And just I wanted to mention that, well, this idea of 
randomness certified by quantum theory is actually something which now goes uh, even out of the labs. Uh, and maybe you heard, I don't know if you heard about it, but just a few days ago, actually even Samsung announced that their next cell phone will contain a quantum chip, which is basically a random number generator with um, randomness created by a um, random quantum process. And um, well, I mean, this, of course, I don't know yes, how, how useful it will be, but it just shows that I think that the field of randomness is really a mature field. Um, and it's getting even out there for everyone to be uh, used. And while this particular application is not yet uh, device independent, actually, even device independent randomness is accessible nowadays. And this is a service which is provided by the NIST and where they produced, they have also a photonic setup and they produced uh, random numbers guaranteed by um, uh, non-local correlations every day in continued. So yeah, at this point, I would like also to just make a short remark to say that, well, unlike maybe other quantum effects that uh, or paradoxes that have been studied and which are really interesting by themselves, of course, well, what is a bit more surprising here, I think, is that what we can observe, obtain this randomness, is really only possible because we have access to uh, um, quantum systems. And I think this is a, a very interesting uh, feature. So now to continue on this, um, this part, I would like to talk about um, uh, something I think is even more striking than randomness. So to see this, let's come back to one of the previous slides that we had before, and this slide. So the what we were saying there is that basically if we have a quantum state, then it's possible to obtain statistics which are above this threshold value of two for this Bell inequality. In particular, they are at this value of two square root two. But now let's go in the reverse direction, namely. Let's start from this value of 2 square root 2 and say, OK, let's say we do this experiment and we observe a value of 2 square root 2. What can we say? Well, as it turns out, this value already is only compatible with just one point in this probability space. So this means if you have a value of 2 square root 2, there's only one set of statistics which gives this, this value. But moreover, if we uh, now ask the question, okay, which kind of quantum states can produce this set of statistics? There is also actually only one quantum state up to local isometries, which can do this. And this is the uh, Maximilian Tangle state of two qubits. And so you see what is really striking here is that we have just one number and from one number, we can really identify the quantum state that is the state of our system. And for this, we are still in a totally black box way because we did not need to assume even that we had qubits in the first place. We could have potentially initially a systems of large dimension. Even if this is the case, we know that this system of hard dimension contains a subset, a subsystem, which is a qubit where this is the relevant state which is being measured. And so this is also called black box certification or self-testing. And I think it's really powerful because it really, as you can see, it gives you a possibility to do tomography to get information about your state, but in a totally blind way. You don't need to trust the measurements. And this, again, is very different from what you would obtain in a uh, classical setting. Because, say, if you want to measure um, something classically, let's say you have a pen and you want to measure what is the length of this pen, that would be the state of the pen. Then a typical way to do that is to take a ruler next to it and then to check what is the length written on the ruler, right? And then if the length says 10 centimeters, then you conclude that your pen is a 10 centimeter long. But of course, this conclusion is only valid provided the ruler was well calibrated. So you could ask how are rulers calibrated? And typically, I mean, rulers would be calibrated by 
comparing them to objects of trusted dimension. And so you see that the classical way is requires to start somewhere, and then you can only build uh, from uh, from a fixed reference point. However, here we start from just one observed statistical value, and this actually informs us directly about the state of the system without having ever to know whether the what was the precision of the calibration of the measurement devices. And even more, actually, this certification would also certify the measurements at the same time. So we'd get both certifications at the same time. I think this is really a new kind of, of, um, of uh, features that are provided by quantum correlations. And so what I would like to, to talk briefly now further into detail is the, the, the fact that this uh, certification is both robust and generic. And by robust, what I mean here is that, well, what happens if you don't observe exactly to the value of 2 to the power 2, but something a bit smaller? Well, then maybe you cannot conclude that you have this state exactly, but can you still conclude that you are somehow, in some measure, relatively close to that state? So to answer this question, let's indeed look at how we can prove this statement, that this value will uh, produce uh, this is only possible to be produced by this state. And so for this, let's uh, consider the state that we are measuring. And initially, since we don't trust this system, we don't know in which dimension it lives. And we also don't know if it's pure or mixed or anything else, right? So this is just a state in a bipartite, arbitrary dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And we would like to compare this state to a, a maximally entangled state of two qubits. So already in the first place, it's really hard to compare objects which live in different spaces. So in order to achieve this, the basic idea is to come here with, ideally, we would like to take a swap operator, which would somehow take the relevant degrees of freedom in this state and exchange them with a qubit degree of freedom, which is initialized in just a uh, constant uh, state zero, so that this relevant information would later come out in a qubit space. And you see, if we can do this on both sides, and then we just discard those unknown Hilbert spaces, then we are extracting a um, two qubit state that can be faithfully at least compared to our target state. But now the question is, of course, okay, how, how, how can we proceed to construct such a swap operator? And so the, the, the approach we used is to, to just remember that the swap operator can be constructed from a C0 gate. So the swap op gate, if you want, is, can be obtained by um, applying successively three C0 gates with inverted control and target qubits. And so this means we can define an operator S, which would be the product U V U, where U and V are each of these uh, C naught gates, ideally. But of course, now we are still in this um, uh, setting where one of the system is of unknown dimension. So how can we write a C naught with one between one qubit and one system of unknown dimension? So the idea here is to um, to write these operators, but by using uh, the measurement operators which are being performed in the experiment as operators acting on this Hilbert space. Because we know that those operators indeed act on the, this, um, this, uh, this space. And so if we do that, then we can define this U and V operator. Therefore, we can define the swap operators in terms of the measurement operators. And this means we can now apply those two swaps on the state and trace the, the, the main system. And we can define this uh, swap state, which is a two qubit state. Now, the interesting thing here is that this two qubit state has some components, and, but all of those components are only uh, moments of the measurement operators, which are uh, being used in the experiment. And at this stage, we can use uh, the Navasquez, Pironio, and Athin hierarchy of um, semi-definite programming, which characterizes precisely those moments 
uh, for our quantum correlations. So this means we can write now a semi-definite program, which would um, look for the minimal possible fidelity of the output state with respect to the target state. And this gives a lower bound on the fidelity of the state with respect to uh, our five plus state. And in particular, we can again plot it just as a function of the CHSH parameter here. And we find that indeed, when the value is maximum, then the fidelity has to be one. This means we are, there's only one possibility, which is this maximum internal state of two qubits. And we see that we automatically get robustness, meaning because if the value is uh, not exactly maximum, we get some lower bound on the fidelity of our state. So this is a construction which is robust by construction. And uh, another interesting feature is that it applies contrary to many of the other self-testing approaches which rely on Jordan's lemma. This approach can be um, um, used for to certify also states of higher dimension than dimension two. Okay, so at this stage maybe you're wondering Okay, so it's fine, we can certify um, measurements and uh, states, which are, but those are basically the fundamental uh, elements of quantum theory. So is, it, is this approach useful to certify anything else than just those basic elements? Can we certify more complex objects in the same way? So um, to show you how this can be done, let's consider now a simple quantum device that would be a quantum memory and um, so what a quantum memory does is it uh, takes a quantum state which is unknown takes it at time to zero and then at the time later time t1 which can be chosen freely it, it should release exactly the same state so i mean here if we want to certify a device like that from a bell violation at least we can expect that there would be some possibility to do that. And maybe one of the reasons for this is that we know that decoherence uh, lowers, reduces the Bell violation. And if we have a lot of decoherence, it's not possible to violate the Bell inequality anymore. This means that if we now use a uh, quantum memory in a Bell type experiment and we still observe a live viol violation, we would expect that there cannot be too much decoherence in the process, and therefore the quantum memory should have some um, some good quality. But again, we have to to, to really um, see how this ID can be formalized and to come up with some uh, actual bounds. So to do that, we now try to compare this ideal uh, quantum memory to a black box, which is performing something similar, is taking a state at time t0 and, and producing another one at time t1. But this time again, maybe the input Hilda space is unknown. And we also don't know exactly what is, or we don't want to trust exactly what is happening there. So how can we uh, compare those two processes? So the way to do that is to, or the way we looked at it at least, is um, by considering an input isometry, or you could say a way to encode the input qubit into the, the Hilbert space, the full Hilbert space of this device, and then a decoding or extracting channel that would take whatever is produced here and try to extract a two qubit state. And once we have that, now we can start to compare for arbitrary input state psi, how does the output state rho compares to the what we expect to be a state psi. And um, and as it turns out, well, this quantity can be indeed be computed as a function of the Bell violation that is observed after, by measuring the output system from the quantum memory. And uh, it takes a simple form in terms of at least this CHSH um, uh, expression. And um, it means that indeed we can now certify the, the fidelity of a tentative quantum memory with respect to an ideal one. And what I would like to point out is also that this certification here is really operational in the sense that now if you have access to this device, you can really pretend that it 
can act as a quantum memory with the associated fidelity because you can always use it instead of an ideal quantum memory and uh, only see a difference by at most uh, as given by this fidelity. So, I mean, I heard that also some people at CIA, maybe in the Quantronic group, are working on quantum memories. And so I guess it would be also interesting at some point to discuss whether uh, this scheme could be applicable to the system or whether it could be uh, useful to demonstrate maybe the quality of, of those systems. That may be something we can discuss in private. Okay, so I hope now you get a um, feeling of how we can certify um, simple quantum devices, at least say devices involving one or two qubits like that. Um, but what about certifying systems with more qubits, with many qubits? What about certifying complex devices? Well, I mean, for sure, a good understanding of what is happening to the elementary uh, system, I think, is would be very valuable uh, for that, and probably also some strong numerical capabilities. But uh, why would we like to consider complex quantum systems in the first place? So I'm sure you're aware of it. I mean, one of the major upcoming quantum device is uh, the so-called quantum computer. I mean, this has just tremendous potential applications uh, in many different fields, even outside science, even for machine learning and things like this. But I mean, quantum computers are very complex. So I mean, let's say you use a quantum computer to do a task that you cannot do as well, otherwise, sorry, then how can you, how should you understand the result that it gives you? Can you trust the outcome of a quantum computer? So, of course, you might argue that, well, if we look at factoring, for instance, then somehow we don't care too much because it's very easy to check. If you try to factor a very large number and then the computer actually gives you two uh, uh, factors, you can check by multiplying them whether this is the correct solution or not. But for many problems of maybe also greater interest, this is not so clear. I mean, for instance, if you use a quantum computer to find a new um, molecule to cure some disease, and it tells you, okay, here is the molecule you should, uh, you should use. I mean, should you directly go and construct the factory that will produce this molecule? Or, I mean, what, 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 you should, do, what should, should you do from, from, uh, from this piece of information? So I think it's very important to ask this question. And as a further evidence of this, I mean, I can even mention, you know, this demonstration, the first demonstration of um, quantum advantage that was performed last year by the Google group. And you maybe heard that it was also um, subject to substantial debate when it came out. I mean, I'm not um, too worried that about, about this actually, but somehow just the fact that it's possible to have a debate on these kind of questions, I think, is another uh, element that shows that, well, some amount of certification would be very beneficial in this area, because this would just not occur if there was a clear way to, to certify the output of a quantum computer. So, well, how can we certify a quantum computation? Well, I think we can argue at least that the device dependent certification is the strongest possible one because precisely it uses very little assumptions. And uh, so I think this is a, a very uh, strong candidate for certifying these kind of devices. And my proposal along these lines is to uh, start already little by little by going one step further from what we did with uh, uh, one and two qubit uh, devices and try now to tackle the, the, set, the task of certifying shallow circuits. So shallow circuits are a kind of uh, quantum circuits which are um, 
which only in, uh, involve a few operations on each qubit, but they already have a huge potential. And so, in particular, it would be possible to demonstrate quantum advantage on these uh, kind of systems. And I think any demonstration of this kind would also be very interesting because it would be applicable to many uh, computing architectures, potentially. Unlike maybe the, the first uh, demonstration, which was, of course, tailored to um, the available resources at Google, and which are hard to apply to different uh, systems. And yeah, I think, as I mentioned before, that some of the tools that we developed here uh, would be applicable in, uh, in this setting. And now another also interesting complex uh, system that is uh, coming up and that is somehow even coming up faster is uh, the quantum simulator. Again, this has a huge impact in many fields. Um, matter, high energy physics, etc. And but one of the advantages of this system is that it can also be performed, quantum simulation can also be performed on a noisy uh, quantum system. So there's no need in principle for error correction, which is a, a great challenge just by itself for quantum computing. However, the same question arises for quantum simulation. I mean, if you use a quantum simulator and you get some results, Maybe you get a phase diagram for some new material. I mean, how should you understand um, or how should you interpret these results? I think it's also important to uh, try to tackle this question and try to come up with a way of uh, certifying uh, the output of quantum simulators. Now, quantum simulators are typically many body systems. And uh, here, so I have some relevant expertise, I think. Uh, especially with respect to quantum correlation in many body systems. And those quantum correlations, as we have seen, they play a key role in uh, uh, device independent certification. So one thing that we did recently with uh, colleagues in Basel was to demonstrate um, the presence of bell correlations in a Bose-Einstein condensate of around 500 atoms. And, um, and this was a result that was uh, recognized by a, a prize, uh, the Paul Ehrenfest uh, Prize recently. Now, even in this uh, context, there are a number of next steps that could be done, just even for the sake of better understanding bell correlations in many body systems. And um, uh, one of them is to better understand the role of, of statistics in uh, this setting. And another one is to try to not only say a binary, obtain a binary answer whether there is bell correlation or there is no bell correlation in a system, but really to try to be able to uh, quantify this, quantify the extent of bell correlations in a many body system. This is a highly challenging uh, question in itself. And we have first results on this uh, direction. And, um, and I think my long experience in Non-locality for multi-parted uh, system would also be um, an advantage in this context. So I hope I could give you a good uh, overview of uh, my project and some of the associated results. I mean, essentially, my, my aim would be to show that um, how quantum correlation can be used to certify, ultimately, a quantum computer or a quantum simulator. And actually, since we have just a few minutes left, let me just tell you a short story uh, to illustrate my point. Um, maybe, well, you, for sure you, you, you know that last century, there were a revolution occurred in the world of music. Uh, that was the appearance of jazz music. This happened in the, around 1917. And the way it happened is that uh, people started to hear this music, and then to, there was a lot of emulation. People started to do more and more of it, and so it became uh, very popular. And uh, so this is the context in which this guy called George Russell uh, grew up. And uh, one day he got interested in uh, music theory. 
so he went to study it. But he realized that music theory at the time was only theory for classical music. And essentially theory that tells you how to write a sonata or a concerto and things like this. But not theory that tells you how to play with Miles Davis, for instance. So he, th he felt that there was really a need for something uh, to be done here. And so he sat down and took some time and he produced this uh, Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization, which is the first uh, treaty of musical theory for jazz. And so what happened next is very interesting because once he did that, then the musician playing jazz who knew what they were playing, they opened the book and they read it and they were like, oh, but this is exactly what I'm doing. Oh, that makes so much sense. Now I understand much better what I'm doing. And at the same time, turning the next page, they were like, oh, I can do this also and so on. And so this gives a, a lot of, uh, of support for the development of, of jazz music. And today we see um, a revolution in uh, quantum technology. And um, what I would like is to write a book for reliable quantum information processing. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. So let us uh, thank the speaker. Well, at least we. Ah, thank you for going. So now we we have time for um, questions. So who is going to be the first? Bertrand. Ah, Nicola. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have uh, several uh, questions. So thank you, Jean Daniel, for the for the very nice talk. Um, I was um, uh, cu curious about uh, um, randomness uh, generation and, and the result that you presented along this line. So you convincingly, I think, shown that you, uh, at least in the past, you provided the theoretical groundwork that is needed for even say implementing a new kind of uh, randomness generator um, with no assumption on the functioning of the devices used to produce the randomness. Um, I was wondering what are the, the next steps now because you know the experiment is done so what, what could we improve? Uh, so basically what are the assumptions that you were using on the power of Eve, of the Eve's dropper? Can we improve on that? And secondly, you know, do you see, um, I don't know, ways um, for making this exciting for, I don't know, industry purposes or commercial uh, application and, and things like this? Thank you. Um... Uh, okay, I'm not sure I understood the question. Maybe you, you can complete if needed. Uh, so, of course, well, I mean, for at least for applications, one of the, I mean, there are many concerns that come up when you try to make something applicable uh, and or even to commercialize it. And so this goes beyond uh, just demonstrating a randomness. So, of course, a level of production costs and also efficiency and uh, um, or the, 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 the rate of randomness, those are all very uh, important quantities um, that can be much improved compared to the experiment that, uh, that, we, that we had, for sure. Um, now, in terms of assumptions, I mean, one of the things that, that could be relaxed even more would be, for instance, to assume that the, um, uh, the settings which, so, in this experiment, you need to make some choice of settings in the, in the, um, uh, for, for both A and B's measurements. And uh, what is assumed here, what we did was to assume that this choice of settings is fully independent from uh, the system. And I think this is a very reasonable assumption for all practical purposes. At least we have no reason to doubt it. But uh, this could also be relaxed. Um, because we know that it's possible to 
still certify randomness, even if the there is some amount of uh, correlation between the in choice of input and the system which is being measured. I mean, this amount of correlation has to be bounded. As mentioned before, if there is uh, a direct uh, full correlation between both of them, you cannot certify anything. But it's possible to still obtain uh, randomness here. Uh, for instance, if those um, uh, if those settings could potentially be partially uh, correlated with uh, the system you are actually measuring. Okay, fine. Okay. Who's next? Well, I have some questions as well. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe uh, you were saying that maybe we can put the camera. You can uh, show yourself if you like. Yes, I'm trying to see. Yes. Well, okay, thanks for the talk, Jean Daniel. Well, as you know, I'm also working on these type of uh, questions. And uh, I just wanted to know how you plan to, let's say, I know and you proved in the talk that you master well all these certification stuff for, say, a few systems. And of course, you did some stuff uh, on uh, this Bose Einstein and more systems. But let's say a quantum computer is much more than two particles, no? So how do you see this transition from this moment in your research, like where you were doing with starting to do things for more particles, but where you were mostly focused on a few particles to deal with a complex device like a quantum computer? And uh, how do you plan to make this transition? And, uh, and also, uh, do you expect that you will need uh, new methods? And, and if so, do you have an idea about uh, how to find these new methods? I mean, what are the methods you want to apply for this transition? Thank you. Uh, so, um, well, I think, well, I already worked a lot actually on many, um, on multipartite system, which could potentially involve really a lot of particles. But it's true that a quantum computer would be something uh, very different and a step further from that. I mean, one of the things I think is useful to, to, uh, uh, to keep in mind is that at least the, the final quantum computer is we may ha of course we all have an idea of what it could be like but i think it's still something uh, uh very uh far i mean until the day we have it on our cell phone and uh, and so on no? and there are actually many uh, many um many intermediate steps if you want uh before we reach there and i think all of these steps also have many possible uh, openings. And so I mentioned one of them, which is uh, the, the study of, I mean, those shallow circuits. So this is a restricted uh, class of uh, quantum computers. And uh, I think those are, because they use only a few operations on um, each qubit, this is something that can be related, uh, that could be related quite uh, directly to uh, the study of a uh, few qubits um, um, system that we already that we already have today, and I mean it's hard for me to tell you exactly what is the way. I mean to tell you today what will be the way that we will do the final step. But I think by progressing little by little, we will find um, what will be the next step to be done after that. Mm -hmm. And, and about the methods, I mean, do you see, uh, do you think that our present methods will be enough or how do you plan that? Uh, enough, well, I mean, maybe in some sense they are, you could say they are enough because for instance, we can potentially, we can already, if you want, characterize quantum correlations. In principle, we can do that. Uh, it's just that of course, to do that in a, uh, an arbitrary system can be very uh, difficult or even just practically impossible. So I think, of course, we will need new methods to just be able to do something. And uh, those methods, I think we'll have to also uh, develop them for each, uh, for each problem specifically.
but yes, I think we will need new methods. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who is next? Yes, ah, if Daniel. I, yes, if I may. Uh, yes, Jean Daniel, uh, you gave a pretty excellent overview of certification of uh, future quantum machines. But are you, before certifying a machine, you have to get it. So are you also interested in, uh, in uh, quantum computer architectures and in uh, developing them? So what's uh, what you're feeling about the different architectures that could lead to a scalable technology? Is it also in your field of expertise? Thank you. Um, so, of course, uh, building, I mean, for instance, electronics or things like this, this is, I, of course, I know about, those, about this, I studied it, right? But this is not my expertise. So, I have, of course, to rely on the work of other people to uh, do some of those things. Uh, however, I think that some of the, the uh, systems that are being used for um, quantum technology, I, I mean, I really also appreciate how uh, the, the physics that is, um, that is present in them. And uh, if I can help in any way, I think I would be happy to help for that. But it's true that I will not have I don't have a lot of experience with this at the moment. Okay. I don't know my, if it answers your question. A, my question is more on the, uh, on the, the theory of, of quantum computer architectures rather than on implementations. But uh, say it's, uh, say, are, you, say, are you also interested in uh, the, the architecture that can lead uh, to a quantum computers at the theoretical level. Um, in, yes, and I think at least uh, I have also some. I'm also interested, for instance, in error correction codes. Yes, and this is precisely I don't know if the type, I don't of, know if the, the type of expertise that the CA is uh, also presently a bit missing. So it's a. Uh, so it's uh, that would be very valuable. So I mean, at least I'm interested in. I'm actually interested in that at the moment at the classical level. But I think this whatever I'm learning now at this level could be uh, transposed uh, uh, to the quantum level because I, most of the quantum error correction codes today are based on the classical ones. But I don't have a lot of experience yet on that. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. I have one more uh, question, Jean-Daniel, if I may. So um, you were talking about the uh, shallow circuit. Can you please let me know what is shallow circuit? So, I mean, shallow circuits are a uh, uh, um, class of quantum computers or comp quantum computations, sorry, where basically, I mean, at least if you look at the circuit model for quantum computing, the way it's um, described usually is you have a number of quantum registers, which are typically qubits, you initialize them, and then you will do your computation by applying gates between, um, uh, between some of those qubits. And but to perform your computation, there will be, I mean, you will need to do a successive number of, uh, of gates. And uh, depending on the computation, this can be potentially you would have to do a lot of uh, uh, a lot of gates. So shallow circuits, basically, those are uh, circuits which are defined where the if you want the scaling of the number of gates that you do compared to the size of your problem is small or is even bounded. So this means that typically, instead of having uh, if you want qubits that you need to keep in really good quality for a very long time in order to apply all the gates you need to do. Uh, shallow circuits are more based on the idea that you can have maybe uh, more qubits, but on each of them, <coughs> you don't need to apply uh, a lot of operations. And 
this is also a, a model which uh, can show quantum advantage, for instance. Mm -hmm. But it's not yet clear whether it's a new implementation or in a new. Yeah, it's it's a new implementation. Is is that correct? The, so the goal you say it's to basically improve the number of qubits, assuming that you have high coherence, and assuming that you have a low processing unit, low fidelity of the processing unit, to keep uh, um, at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, to, to have a useful quantum computer. Is it is it. Uh, this way that it works, or uh, it, I think it's well. At least the way I see it is more as a kind of architecture, like we just mentioned before. It's yeah. an architecture for quantum computation. Yes, and it's one where you uh, you don't need to do many upper gates on each qubit. Essentially, okay. Because you, I mean, the cost is that you have a lot of qubits. This is the price to pay. So then, the pr yes, then the price to pay if you want to do. Uh, complex computation is yes. you would have to compensate by that by having more qubits. Okay, but then it all depends on what you want to do, right? I mean, yes. mm -hmm. I think it's not really well defined or known what, for instance, are the minimal number of qubits you need there mm -hmm. in order to have a clear demonstration of uh, quantum advantage, for instance. Okay, so it it might be very promising in case where you have a scalable system in terms of of qubits. And we maybe the, the the gate operation are not performed very accurately. Am, am I right? Um, well, it's more that you okay if you if they are not performed accurately, maybe, or if just you cannot perform too many of them. This is more the critical yeah. uh, parameter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, who is next? Who wants to ask a question? Tony again? Yes, okay. Well, I can have a, have a few more. So, uh, your your talk you put on uh, say quantum information theory for pr proper devices, okay? But I know that you have uh, been working sometimes very close to experiments, okay? So perhaps you can tell us about the experimental platforms you master and uh, what are the in your opinion, uh, interesting platforms. I mean, uh, do you plan to keep this contact with uh, experiments? And uh, if so, which ex experimental platforms uh, are you interested in? This is one question. And the second question goes to the other uh, side. Let's. I also know that you work on quantum foundations. But somehow here, you didn't say much, OK? Do you plan to keep doing stuff in this direction, like more speculative questions? And well, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell us about uh, things closer to experiments, real devices, OK? I mean, yes. it's the real, like, uh, real uh, experimental platforms, OK? And on the other side, if you can tell us whether you are still interested in more speculative questions. Yeah. So I mean, so the experimental platforms I've been uh, collaborating with they include, of course, uh, photonic uh, setups, uh, like SPDC sources. But also, so I mentioned this work on the uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, so uh, many body uh, ultra cold atoms, and uh, uh, maybe I'm missing some. Uh, but those are, are the ones where I definitely have uh, uh, experience collaborating. And um, um, now for. Uh, uh, what I propose here, of course, all the systems are uh, more promising, and uh, especially for the long term. So for sure, um, superconducting uh, qubits are a very good uh, uh, platform. But then you also have, um, or you could have also uh, spin systems uh, and many more. Um, now. Actually, if you think about now, not the 20 years uh, perspective, but um, a few years perspective, there will also be, I think, possibilities to do um, things in the direction of quantum computation with really a broad uh, uh, range of setups. 
And for instance, this uh, shallow um, circuits that I mentioned before, I mean, one way to have uh, a so shallow circuit without having to keep too many um, uh, qubits in memory, for instance, is to just produce them uh, one at a time or few at a time. And so this is also something that is possible, for instance, with uh, quantum dots. And so you see, I mean, there's really a lot of, of uh, implementations out there. And I think uh, some, I mean, of course, a lot of them have a potential for for uh, for these things. Now, your question about uh, uh, foundations um, is true. I okay, I did not mention it explicitly. Actually, I, I well, I refer to it as new insight on quantum theory. So you have it here on this side. I mean, my belief is that, and my experience also, is that a lot of things that are um, uh, discovered at the fundamental level are turn out to be uh, useful or at least insightful when we consider also applications. And so I want to keep a tight link also with uh, this uh, community. And uh, I'm still also involved in this community. And I think that can be very fruitful and uh, also balance uh, balance a direction which would be towards both experiments but with a strong uh, theoretical background which would also bring diversity so that's that's uh, um, that's how i see it okay thank you thank you so michel bauer yeah i see you have a questions yes i do you, you okay. hear me yeah. yes 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 so i was wondering uh, whether there was a fundamental difference between the device that Samsung is going to offer and which seems to be based on some of your work to generate quantum bits and the one advocated by Nicolas Gisin already six years ago when that was available on Android Market and Apple Store and all that. So what, what's the fundamental difference between the two? Uh, so, I mean, the one by Nicolas Gisin, do you mean the one from his uh, startup company? Well, there was a small application I forgot the name. I'm sorry. That, that could that was supposed to produce quantum bits on your uh, uh, phone. So I guess. It's... Ah. Ah, okay, maybe from the from the sensor from the photographic yes. sensor. Yes, exactly from the sensor. Yeah, you're totally yes. right. So what's what's the fundamental difference between what is proposed by Samsung and what was proposed by this application? I mean, uh, essentially, it's uh, it's basically they integrated that. So, oh, okay. if you want the chip that they that they have, uh, is basically contains kind of a uh, photographic uh, uh, signal sensor, and it also has a source of light. It's just very small, so this can be integrated into electronics. And but I think the the principle behind that is exactly the same. It's basically the uh, the fluctuation in photon numbers. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Yeah, I would have another question. Um, not technical question, but um, more general question. So we, we worked together in the past, Jean Daniel. So do you see it as a as a weakness or as a strength of your application? Um, Well, for me, it's really a, a strength uh, because I think we are uh, very complementary. And this is also somehow related to uh, maybe the question of uh, Professor Asin before. Because in some sense, I mean, you have more, of course, of an experience with uh, quantum optics. And you are also uh, naturally able to talk to uh, many experimentalists. And um, um, on my side, I have another set of, uh, of expertise. And this includes foundation, as we mentioned, and also uh, numerical methods and things like this. And I mean, at least what we have seen in the past by collaborating precisely is that this is a very good mix. So, I mean, I think our collaboration has been very uh, fruitful and it was even recognized by prices. And so I think this is 
process the algorithmics to have uh, a complementary uh, set of expertise put together. So I see it really as, a, as an advantage for, uh, for the Institute of, of Theoretical Physics. Thank you. And, and if I may continue along this line, so now that the, the collaboration with me is, is clear and you're right to say that it was already successful in the past, how do you see that your work could complement the, the activity of others in the Institute? I don't know of people working in, uh, I don't know, in string theory, in high energy physics, in condensed physics. Uh, do you see how you could um, collaborate or at least uh, discuss with them in the, in, in the coming years? Well, at least there are, um, when you think of, of quantum computing or quantum simulating, simulation, there are clearly applications in a really wide range of topics, even just within physics. And so there are already proposals, you know, to, um, to address um, problems in high energy physics or in condensed matter physics and how to address them with quantum simulators. And I would expect even more of these links to be done in the future. And I think these, of course, I don't have a uh, strong expertise in uh, condensed matter uh, physics. I don't have a strong expertise in uh, high energy physics. So if we want to do then something about quantum simulation for those systems, I think that will be a very good place uh, to collaborate. And that would be, uh, so a way to put um, our mutual expertise to uh, good use. Thank you. So who's next? Well, I had a few questions. Uh, yeah, so you, uh, just at the, in the introduction of your talk, you, you said, if I remember and understood well, that you were one of your strengths was a, a problem of a numerical optimization, which is something very good. But uh, for me, since you presented a very you know large and broad overview, I didn't see very well in w in which questions you are in your various works. Uh, you need very good yeah. you know, advanced numerical optimization and uh, why and etc. So c can you, maybe it's a bit too technical of a question, but no, no. I I'd like to, to understand why. Sure, uh, let me come back maybe to, let's see if I can come back to some slides. Um, so, so, I mean, one of these um, advanced uh, numerical optimization is uh, what is called semi-definite programming, or mm -hmm. more broadly speaking, convex optimization. I mean, this is quite a recent field of mathematics, it's still under development. And uh, what you see is that um, this is actually a very useful tool to describe quantum correlations. And um, basically the best tool that we know of today. And so for instance, in this work where we certified um, a device in a black box manner, we precisely used this tool. This was the tool which gave us basically those curves. Okay. If you want. Yeah, but so so the, but this numerical. Well, I'm not at all an expert in uh, um, mm -hmm. sure. beginning of simulation, but it involves uh, calculation of what kind of size and how many variables in practice do you have to to use? Because we, here you 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 show just sure. single curves. So for sure, a naive yeah. people like that, I say, well, okay, maybe it's just given by some very simple equation. I'm sure it's not, but can you elaborate more? So, so yeah, yeah, sure. So essentially, um, uh, so let's say for this particular technique here. Yes. Uh, what happens that th is that this is actually a hierarchy of semi-definite programs. This means that basically you can solve the program at different levels. Yeah. And each level will be somehow more complicated. So it will have more variables, more constraints, and so on, right? And um, so here, actually, what are the variables in this case? Those are basically moments. Mm -hmm. So those are expressions of this form. And you see, they are, in principle, unbounded. So you can have as many as you want, because you can just have many products yeah. of A, A1, A2, A1, A2, A1, A2. Because A does not commute the operators, then yeah. those are the always new variables. So typically here, uh, I don't remember exactly the size here, but I think that 
I would expect it to have probably around 10,000 variables in this case. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I can look it up, but it's it's. Uh, okay. Typical. I mean, the actual amount. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Typically, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I I had I think I had uh, other questions, but I let the people in the audience uh, ask their question while I'm looking for it. Hi. Um, I have a question. I'm uh, Yossi oh, Okay. I'm, uh, Can you show yourself? Because yes, I I'm trying to. I have to allow various things. Yes. Uh, just a second. No uh, Keep on. Keep on asking me to allow. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, apparently the system. We have to find uh, yeah. how it works. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question about the quantum foundations. I'm working in string theory and um, black hole information. I don't know, um, yeah. My question was: Can you be more? Do, 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 um, have, have you thought about the uh, of quantum information theory yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. for um, for black hole physics and for things for 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 the um, for the things that people work um, on the physics of black hole? I know pe many many pe people working on quantum information have thought about those things. I'm just wondering, since since you worked in the field, have you thought about these issues? And do you have any any comments? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so, well, I know indeed there are uh, links between uh, quantum information and uh, black hole. And actually, I, I have some friends who work in this direction. Um, but I did not uh, work on it myself so far. And so I have, I basically just know the general things, such as uh, Hawking radiation and things like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe maybe we can talk more about it uh, in our discussion later. Sounds good. Sounds I'll be good. interested to, to hear about it. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, okay, so uh, I have to look for my questions again. Uh, yeah, you, you spoke about tomography. Well, it's related, I think, that's to questions that uh, people have been asked already. But when we discuss this, um, uh, the fact that you, that you violate uh, Bell's inequality and CHSS, and you basically reach, if I don't remember well, this 2 square root of 2 is called the Tirelson bound in, uh, yes. in the field. Yeah. So when you reach that, you say that you do tomography. But this was, of course, on a, on a simple system. So you mentioned, so my question is, can you do tomography using these methods on quantum system with many more, you know, many more, uh, well, uh, higher dimensional states and, uh, for instance, three, well, beyond two or three, which, well, three or four, which are the simple case. But you yeah. discussed probably that already or answered to some question in different settings. But when, you, so can you go to tomography of complex uh, quantum systems using this kind of, uh, and for general states, or, or just precisely for some very special states that optimize these bounds? No, no. So, so yes, thank you for the question. So, actually, this uh, uh, tomography or self-testing results, those are, uh, I mean, this is still work in progress. So, many people actually are working on those questions. And so, essentially, what is known is that, mm -hmm. for instance, every pure b state mm -hmm can be uh, self-tested in this way. Okay. So if you have a bipartite system of arbitrary dimension, there are, I mean, it has been proven that it is possible to identify the, which state you have exactly uh, with this method. Okay. Now, if you have more um, more, more systems of yes. other dimensions, there are also results in this direction. There okay. are families of states for which it is known. And, uh, but actually it's still an open question. What are the set of states which have this property. Ah, okay, and yeah. So you expect that there are only a finite uh, subset of states which have this property and that can be studied? Well, I think it's from now. The conjecture is more that, okay, so when we go to more than two, um, I know you have to take into account more more effects or so than just isometries and things like this. Yeah. But at least there's no, if you uh, accept this kind of generalization, I think at the moment there's no, Counter example, I mean, that nobody has found yet a state 
for which we know that we could not do that. So the, I would say, well, we don't know the answer, but okay. for now, at least the tendency is that every state that was tested and that people really try to find, so far they could find uh, a method for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There was a question from Eli Gouzin, Gouzien, uh, which was, I didn't see because I have large screen, so I can have a look at. So Eli, can you get your... Uh, so the question was, could you comment on the use of, mini and, of mean entropy for characterization of randomness? But maybe it's better if you ask it by yourself, if you can activate your camera. It was about, uh, well, 10 minutes ago, the question was yes. asked, nine, yes. nine. Ah, okay, welcome. Okay, so hello, Jean-Daniel. So, um, yeah, you, so, okay, so here you said that randomness is certified uh, by mean entropy. Uh, could you explain more the reason why you choose mean entropy and not something else? Maybe in a security perspective? So, I mean, mean entropy is, um is basically capturing um, uh, precisely, I mean, how well a, a, an adversary can, um, or it's really characterizing the amount of information, if you want, that is available on the system in the, in the worst case. So that is why uh, we use this. I mean, if you think, for instance, of uh, uh, quantum cryptography, this is also the relevant, um, uh, figure of merit. So, for instance, the key rate, so the secure key rate, if you do quantum key distribution, this is uh, characterized in terms of, of mean entropies also. Because it can be related really in an operational way, meaning that um, if you have some mean entropy, you know that there is also a measurement that can uh, give you this amount of uh, information on your system. Okay. Okay, and uh, could you bond the information uh, F could have on non-exact uh, string? Because you, you see here the probability is the probability to guess the exact string. But maybe F could have uh, enough information without the full uh, string. Uh, well, so actually, this this would this would still boil down to that. So I mean, okay, maybe one way to to to, to see it is is if you have. Um, so of course, there are several strings, right? And so, if you want, okay, let's say we have, um, or let's say we just have one bit. A string of one bit, which can be zero or one, right? And so the, each string, each of the two string, uh, will be associated with one probability of occurring, from the perspective, from the point of view of the adversary. And so somehow, now if uh, one of the string is has the highest probability, then you see that this will be by default the best guess that the adversary will will have to make. Now, if you have a, a string of many bits, there will be more than two uh, possible strings. And each string could have a different probability of occurring. But still, if the adversary needs to guess this string, somehow the best guess that he can do is look at which of the string has the highest probability. And so this is exactly what is quantified by the main entropy, is the element which has the string, if you want, which has the highest probability. And Somehow, the thing is, if he, if he guesses something else, then he will still not know which of the bits of the string are correct, if you want. So, so somehow the best he can do is really take the one which, which has the highest probability. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, are there uh, other questions? Well, we already had uh, many of them, so, and, uh, well, you are going to have the possibility to discuss with uh, Jean-Daniel uh, later on in the next uh, hours or days. Uh, so, uh, well, let, let us thank the speaker again. Thank you. We should have a...